Hey guys, and welcome back to another Unfiltered Gamer board game review for the game Nerthania Collapsing World. This is a two to four player game that takes roughly about an hour and a half to two hours to play, and it's rated just 13 and up. And in the game Nerthania, you're basically going to be a kingdom. You're going to be a kingdom on a, ra a unique land that's going to be inhabited by plains, water, and mountains. You're gonna set up a base, you're gonna have an army and an adjacent location, and then you're gonna have other little areas, little settlements around the continent. Additionally, everybody else was well. And this is a Forex style game. You'll be exploring and exterminating and exploiting, etc., etc., all to complete one or more of seven different objectives. Throughout six rounds of play, you're going to be trying to gather certain areas that are mountains or certain portions of the border that be on the sides or the middle and fight in battles of at least five or more on both sides and win. You're going to have your own player board, your own unique characters, your own unique dice, as well as your own unique character cards that you can use to upgrade the characters on your board. It's a little bit of a Civ style game, it's a little bit of an area control style game all put into one. After six rounds, whoever has the most points based on those seven objectives is the winner. Let's get into how to set up, how to play, and of course, my review. Setup for the game Northania is quite complicated and complex, so I'm just going to kind of illustrate the basic idea. You'll need to look in the rulebook for how to correctly set the game up. But what we have here is a full setup. I've only put two characters on the board. Typically, you could have four here. And how it works is pretty simple. You're going to draw cards from the deck that has the, the, the different types of land areas on them. And all the cards that you draw based on the number is going to give you basic plains or forest areas. They won't be mountains and they won't be the water areas. And then you're going to be left with plains and you'll be left with water. Then you're going to draw cards from the cards that you picked uh, that you placed down to form a few mountains. In this case, I have five mountains on the board. There are four continents. You have blue, you have gray, you have brown, and you have yellow. And each of these areas are going to be consumed with either water or forest slash plains areas and mountains. You'll take each of the tokens of the color type and you will put them down on each of the different portions of each of the continent. If it's a mountain, so mountain portion, you're going to put the side with the little rock. And if it's not, it will be placing, you'll be placing the other token, which is going to be silver. Even the water spaces will get them as well. Color to color, only difference is you flip them if they're mountains. After you've done that, the rest of the uh, different types of land tiles will be set aside because there's terraforming in this game that happens, the sh shifting land, uh, which could make your land go from the plains to your mountains or the plains to the water area. And that can change how the board looks and how you can interact with the game board. Each player is also going to get their own character board or, or kingdom board, I should say, which is gonna come with six different character types or, or like infantry types. It's going to come with um, anywhere between like six and seven uh, upgrading tiles that you'll be placing on your board in order to allow you to create new units. You're also going to get a ton of units. Uh, there are unique units that are crafted as an explanation as to what they'll look like um, when this game is fully done. And of course, I have the prototype version, but I'll show you guys these ones here. You're also going to be getting dice. Each of your different characters, different units are going to have their own unique dice compared to anybody else. So always make sure that all of your different tiles match your board, all of your different dice match your characters. And you have a little pool somewhere around there. You're also going to get a deck of cards. These cards are going to have your units and they'll have rankings from one, two, and three. You're always going to start with rank one and you're always going to start with your red unit on rank one. All the rest of them will be set aside and they'll start on rank one when you get them. You're going to get five cubes. One is going to be your starting silver, which is 20, and the rest of them are going to be utilized as actions. The rest of your cubes will go off to the side and you'll use them for whenever you complete an objective, which I'll talk about in a second. Uh, additionally, you're going to be getting one of these tokens here. Uh, these are going to be for terraforming. And the other token you'll get is for when you draw cards and terraform certain areas at the end of every round at the beginning of the game as well. Placing the characters down on the game board is you're gonna be placing a base on one of the continents and everybody else will do the same. And then you'll place up to six, you'll place six units on that space or, an, um, or slash and an adjacent space. So you'll basically get the base space and one that's adjacent and you can place six units on either, any of the two spaces with whatever you're min maxing. I think it's the lowest you can do is five to one or you can do three to three, it's really up to you. 
Uh, there's a few rules with placing down the uh, board and whatnot, but the main one is if there's a five silver marker, you can never place another five silver marker adjacent to it so that they're kind of spread out. After everybody's placed their base and placed their units in there and an adjacent space, then you'll basically place another two units on a different continent in the same way. You pick a space and you place it on an adjacent space and everybody else will do the same. Then you'll pick another continent and do the same. So you should have six units on one continent, which is where your base is, two on another, and two on another for a total of 10 units. After everybody's done that, then you're basically going to be getting um, the seven objective cards and you'll place them within reach of all players, which is where your cubes are, so that you can go ahead and utilize uh, or complete them when you need to. And then of course, the mountain resources, these are what you use to basically craft your powerful infantry. You'll set those within reach of all players so they can utilize that as well. Make sure that you have any of your animals that you need and Otherwise, that's pretty much the setup for the game. Yes, for specifics, you'll have to look at the rule book, but I think this gives you a good idea. Playing Nathania is pretty simple, actually. How this game works is there are six rounds, and there are four turns for each player in each round. I'm starting, and it's my turn, so I'll take a cube and I'll place it on my pizza chart. I'll put it on any one action I want. I can never place an additional cube on an action that already has a cube, and I'll take that action. Then the next player will take one of their cubes and place it on one of their actions and we'll rinse and repeat until all four of our actions have been completed. Once all four actions have been completed, the end of the round will do its thing. The first thing that happens is we're going to draw cards and we're going to terraform spaces based on those cards. The first card you get, you get two of them, will tell you what space it is and the second card you get will tell you what happens to that space. Uh, if it's a this, it's going to turn into a this. If it's a this, it'll turn into a this. You'll do that for each player playing the game, and that's how you'll use your terraforming markers. And then you're going to go ahead and rinse and repeat. All while at the beginning of a round or at the end of the round, it's really up to you, before you start the next round, you're gonna get silver for every space that you occupy that has silver. Silver is what you use in order to upgrade units, place down buildings, place out units, etc. Okay, so let's talk about actions. So the first action that you can take is you're able to take it on the top portion of your game board. It's going to let you gain currency. This is the only way where you can get the little magma rocks. Otherwise, you're only getting silver at the end of every round. In this case, you'll select a continent. You'll select three areas in that continent that has a unit that you control, and you'll gain the value. Five silver and five silver and a mountain will get you 10 silver and a rock. The next action you can take is you're going to be able to build. Now you have these little square tiles that you'll be placing on your game board. They start off as uh, start off as like black and white, and then your tiles are colored. So when you place them down on your game board, that symbolizes that you've constructed that area, which will then allow you to take the card of that area. Usually it could be like a hunter, or it could be like a beast of some sort, and you're going to be able to construct them now that you have built the space. It'll cost you three silver to do this. That's right, spend three silver, place a marker on the specific area that you want to build. The only rule by this is that you have to at least build one of the tier one areas, which are the top portions, before you can build the two, which are the bottom portions. Next action. You can spend any amount of currency to create any amount of units that you have available to you. So if I built the horses and I started with warriors, I can build horses and warriors. I can spend any amount of silver that I have to build as many as I want to place them on the game board. There are only two restrictions. The first restriction is how much money that you have and the uh, corresponding units that you can place out on the board. And the second thing is that each space on the game board has what is called a C area, a capacity. So if it says C4, you can never have more than four people or characters on that space. If it says C6, you can never have more than six. So you'll be spending money, picking up units, and placing them on spaces that you control. Not spaces you don't control, and not spaces that are empty. Next action is you can move and attack. The way it works is you will select a continent and you can move any units in any of the areas their movement, which is gonna be found at the top left-hand corner of your cards. So if I had a bunch of wolves and this continent that I wanted to move, I can move them three spaces and movement works pretty simple. You can't move through water and you must move from, to, from one adjacent space to the next. And you can move any amount of units in that one continent. However, you may only battle one time for this action. So it is move from a continent any of your units based on the movement on their card and then perform one battle. Battle is simple. In order to start a battle, you need to move your units from an adjacent space into a space that has enemy units. And we'll talk about battling after I finish all the actions. 
The next action is you can spend three currency, three silver, to do it again. Move and battle. Then there's just two more actions left. The next action you can do is you can spend three silver to upgrade one of your cards. If you have, uh, for instance, let's say that you upgraded to get wolves and then you uh, place them onto the field. If you want, you can spend a victory card, which you can only get when you win a battle, and three silver to upgrade from a one tier card to a two tier, to, to, to a two -tier card, which is going to give you more power with that specific unit when you do battle. Cards are basically things that you can play and gain a benefit from when you play them during a battle, but you can only play two. The last action in the game is to terraform. In order to terraform, you have to have your terraforming token and you have to place it on a space that's adjacent to a space that you control. When you place it on that space, you may then remove that space or add something to the space. So if you place it on a mountain, you can make it go down to a field. If you place it on a field, you can choose which way. Or if you place it on a water area, you can make it turn into a field. Thusly terraforming the board, allowing you to get to through to different locations or preventing other players to get to your areas. And those are all the different actions. So you'll be taking four actions and you can never take the same one twice, which is why you can choose to attack twice at the cost of three extra currency. So how does attacking work in the game? Well. Attacking is simple and also has a structure to it. You are going to be moving your units. So for instance, I can move my units into a space that has opposing characters. Now that space can never have more than the limit, but you may never move more than six units into battle, ignoring the C slash capacity of the space. So you will always be able to attack with at least six units on the location. You can also choose to attack with archers that are on adjacent spaces. What happens is you will decide the number of dice you need to use. If, for instance, you have a warrior, which requires a red die, and you attack with an archer, which requires a green die, you'll have two dice to use for the battle. And each of the different characters are gonna have their own die associated with them. So if I'm attacking with five warriors, I'll take five red dice, and these are what I'm going to use for battle. And ad ad additionally, archers can fight um, on adjacent spaces. So if I fought with five warriors and I had three spaces that were adjacent with archers, I could take three green dice, meaning I'm fighting with eight. My opponent will do the same, taking whatever dice they have for the area that they are in, and they're gonna roll those. Once you roll your dice, then you're going to move on to the next portion of combat. You're gonna check to see if there's panic. If there's panic, uh, which usually happens from a stronger character, you're going to uh, make one of your opponent's characters from that area move to an adjacent space, AKA retreat. If there's no spaces adjacent that they have a character on, they can go to an empty space. If a character ever retreats for any reason during combat, they're going to lose a die of their color from the combat pool. So if I wanted to retreat with one of my barbarians, I'd have to remove a barbarian die from the combat. Then people are going to decide if they're gonna use any special cards that are gonna implement themselves in battle. So there are a few cards, mainly called animal cards, that you can say, hey guys, I'm gonna use this card. So do note that if you ever want to promote a character or make a character run away, I'm gonna use this card in the future so that you can actually remove it prior to. But in general, this is not gonna happen all that much. What will likely happen is you're going to be checking to see how many of your dice have an arrow symbol. These symbols are going to allow you to bring adjacent units that are yours into the space that the battle is taking place. When you do so, you'll roll that character's die and it's now in battle for you. So you can actually have more than six units on a space of your type when you actually bring them in. You're basically recruiting units on adjacent spaces to kind of fight the battle. Each player is going to do that and then they'll roll their dice for them and then that's when battle cards take place. The attacker will play one of their battle cards, which are basically just your tiered cards, and you'll perform all the actions on the left-hand side of the card. The right-hand side of the card just dictates how much the unit costs when you play it out and what type of different sides their dice has. So in one case, it might be that this combat gives you an extra attack or an extra defense or lets you reroll a die, et cetera, et cetera. I play a card, you play a card. I play a card, you play a card. After two cards are played, and the cards have to be with units that are engaging in this battle, and everything has been calculated based on rewalls and whatnot, then you're going to finalize. You're gonna see who wants to retreat based on the amount of retreat dice that they have. And remember, when you retreat, you have to remove the dice of that type when you do so. And um, each, I will do it first, the attacker and the defender will do it, and then we'll calculate. And calculating is really easy. It's basically, I have three attacks and a defense. 
you have two attacks and a defense, you will take two damage, um, and I will take one, in which case we will check to see who has the most units in the area. The player that does wins the combat, ties go to the defender, and if you can retreat, um, if, you, if, you, if the battle is settled and this is after the retreat, um, you can actually move your units away, but, but the rule is still the same. You have to move into a space that is uh, adjacent, that has yours, or if there is none, then you can move to an empty space, and if there's none of that either, then your characters will just disappear. Whatever you have left in that space, so for instance, if it's a C2 and you have five units left, you're gonna have to get rid of characters until you only have two. So make sure that you don't try and overload a battle or it will cost you extra units than you need to spend. When you win a battle, you'll take one of the land cards and this card is going to be utilized for increasing the value of your cards, going from tier one to tier two to tier three. And that's how battles work in the game. And it's fairly simple. Um, and you're just gonna play those six rounds out. And that's pretty much all the game is. At the end of every single round, when we've all used all of our four actions, players are gonna draw their two cards. They're gonna see what terraforms um, and it will change the game significantly as the game goes on, as well as you being able to terraform yourself. But there you go. That's the style for the game Nathania Collapsing World, which is fitting because the world is definitely collapsing. So Nathania is one of those games that I tell people is kind of a pretty simple game to understand, but it has a long amount of gameplay and it is a heavy game to like set up and each of the different intrinsicacies will let you do a whole lot of things. Yes, spending currency to summon the warriors that you have purchased or that you have the buildings for is really simple, straightforward, but you have to select which ones you want and where they're going to go, which requires time. Um, some actions like upgrading a location that you didn't previously have, like I wanna make archers, I'll spend three and I'll put this archer hut down, allowing me to get more archers is actually a pretty quick action. So the main ones that you're actually gonna to have to focus on are where you place your units and then you're moving and attacking. Cause moving and attacking is definitely the most thing that you're gonna do in this game. And the reason why is because you want to score victory points. And there are seven different victory point conditions at the end of the game, which I didn't talk about in my example of the game. So hopefully you're still listening at this point to understand how to play. But at the end of the sixth round, you'll get points for each of the conditions that you completed, whether it be secure, um, each of the different middle locations or have units in three different side locations or win a battle where you set five units against another person's five units, et cetera, et cetera. There's 12 different points you can get. And when you place one of your cubes on there, that secures it. And because this is my review portion, I'm actually going to let you know that this is actually very cool. It doesn't matter if you have a ton of guys in a ton of regions. That's not really important. It doesn't matter that you keep your objectives after you complete them. Once you complete them, you put a cube down that signifies you've got the point and you can move on. You can select to do each different um, objective one at a time in different orders, or if you're close to one, or even during setup if you get one, that can actually secure you even more points leading you to victory. The game is about kind of a risk type of a game where it does have a bit of luck as far as the dice, but it's mitigated by the cards. It's also mitigated by the fact that each battle is only gonna have a certain number of characters. So even when you're overwhelming somebody else, it might cost you more than it's actually worth to do combat. So it might insinuate you to make the combat more fair, but in that case, you could actually lose the combat. And because you're looking for objectives, each of the different waypoints and various things you're trying to do is gonna be important as well. Also, at the beginning of the game, each of the, your opponents are gonna be placing down these area control markers that you're gonna to need to capture. And so at certain points in the game, you're gonna to need to get to those areas on the board to secure your additional points, because that's three different areas that you can control and three points that you can gain just by getting it one time. There's also a cool objective where you can control one player's base. So at certain points in time, it might be beneficial for you to kind of do a little bit of a sneaky maneuver and get there and secure it. And all the while, everything's very simple. On your turn, you're just picking an action and they're mainly just letting you put out units and move those units. The rest of them are, you know, you use them, but more sparingly. Um, and at the end of the round, you're gathering the currency of the spaces you control, which is the main objective for the area control aspect is to have currency. And so having more spaces are important, but some spaces generate no currency or only one, whereas others generate five. So there's definitely different areas on the game board that are gonna be more important as the game progresses. What I also like about this game is the fact that each faction is different. Not only are all the character cards and their tiers different, but also the dice are different for each of those characters as well, making them feel unique. My archers might not be really great at assisting in combat, but uh, perhaps they're going to allow me to allow retreats to happen for my characters, or I can bring them into combat and make them have kind of an attack dice, or I can have more than one archer in an adjacent space 
firing into one area, giving me additional combat die. My wolves might be able to run in really quickly and deal with cavalry, maybe a little bit better than other characters. And then I have things like my werebears, which we want to call them, they're big bears. I kind of wish that they actually had a name on the cards here, but this is a prototype, so we'll see what it looks like at the end. Um, but, but like they all function very differently. The factions all kind of feel their own unique type of way, and each of the characters themselves feel unique with their dice. Yes, this is a luck-driven game mainly though. Rolling is going to affect your play, and if you roll poorly, you will lose. It is definitely more mitigation than risk. There's a lot more thought and tactics in that game, and the added aspect of the world collapsing and being rebuilt with terraforming is a nice one. I love the idea, because I love the idea of being able to kind of protect yourself in certain ways, or get through to your opponent's areas if you want, but it's very powerful, but it costs you an action, and every action is very, very vital. You need to decide which one of the actions you want to use in the game. If you're looking for a game that's more of like Cthulhu Wars or something like that, this might not be your cup of tea, because this game involves lots of dice chucking. There is mitigation, but you're still going to have it, and there's going to be those feel-good moments and feel-bad. I love the mitigation though when it comes to having to fight certain areas that has a small capacity, and somebody brings in a huge army, Oh yeah, you defeat me, I run away. And now you've got all your units left over and you only have two spaces, so you lose them all. So you can actually kind of utilize people's willingness to sacrifice units to get objectives to your benefit by making their forces weaker so that when you come into them, you'll get your chance as well. I love how all the objectives are different, allowing people to choose and like pick and choose where they want to go and what they want to do. It all feels really nice. I also like, my next favorite thing is these miniatures. I hope, please make these double-sided. That would be really cool if they were etched on both sides. Otherwise, I'll probably just be placing them face down, but so that I can see them nice and easy. Um, that would be cool if they were double-sided etched, but these look wonderful. What I have are prototypes for the most part, but these guys here are the real deal. This, in general, um, I'm very excited to play with this when the, pro when the finished product comes out, if I get it, because um, I love these units. It feels really cool. It makes the world feel really open and, um, like the, where my forces are located, just I, I just like it. And I love the artwork for the game too. Artwork is beautiful and the board is beautiful as well. Okay, so some negatives. First thing is the setup is a slog. There's a lot of stuff to do. And if you don't know how to do it the first time, it's gonna take you a while. Additionally, the setup for your player board area is challenging. Remember that you have to have all your pieces with each of your specific units um, because each die is different and blue dice are not necessarily blue dice. Each character, because it's so unique, you wanna make sure that they always stay together. So hopefully the box has a really cool insert that makes sure I can keep each of my forces separated without having to put everything all back in the same bag because then I'm gonna pull it all apart. So really the insert is gonna determine how much the setup is gonna be nice to you guys when putting it up putting it away and putting it out. Because putting it away is really simple and taking it out is challenging when you got a whole bunch of bags. So hopefully the insert is really nice. Um, another thing with this game is the combat. Uh, I love the combat actually. I think it's really cool, really unique. It gives a lot of different steps that focus on the dice that make your characters all feel different. But the one thing I don't like about it is you have to announce when you play certain cards. Some of the cards like my wolves here will say that you can your, your enemies cannot bring in reinforcements one you know, they'll lose one of the reinforcement die so if they roll one reinforcement that die will go away the problem is the cards don't get played until later so you have to announce that you're casting this card in order for it to happen and i wish there was a better way that that happened but otherwise the combat is very straightforward and the steps are fairly simple but adding those blue cards in kind of made it a little more of a slog than i would have liked it to be um, but otherwise, I enjoyed it. I like the fact that the archers played a huge role in the game, but they were really squishy if you got too close to them, and they can be used to fortify different areas, and the characters all felt pretty cool to play and pretty pretty unique as well. But this is a dice chucker, so if you're not looking for a dice chucker, this is going to be that game, and you need to stay away. Um, another thing that this game um, was a bit challenging for is you have to recognize um, when the different tiles are going to be removed at the end of the round. You have to look through all these tokens here and find the ones that are terraformed. So I hope that they're going to be a little bigger so it's easier to see them. Um, so it'll be like, oh, this one here was where, you know, oh, this one here was one, that's already there it is, right? It was one that needs to go to uh, the island area. So we need to take this off. Um, 
or this is going to go and turn into a mountain. So I need to find the mountain tile for it. I need to place it on. I need to flip this over. And it can be a little tedious, I suppose. It's not the worst. It's not super bad, especially with even with four players. If you know where you place yours and they do as well, you just take one off or put one on from the big stack over here. But I just wish there was a cleaner way of doing it. Overall, though, this is a really cool game. I love the aspect of putting uh, the board and having it very, be very different each and every time you play the game. The mountain aspect, allowing you to get those crystals that you need in order to basically make your big wolves and your big werebears or whatever it is. There's a bunch of other different types of monsters each character has, but they require not only silver, but those things. And the only way you can get that is by actually using the the gain resources action on the top portion of the card here. Um, so it kind of adds these really cool, really powerful monsters that are hard to deal with because you can always retreat with them if you don't want to take the damage, um, but you'll lose maybe possibly the battle for doing so. But um, yeah, it, it's solid. Oh, I forgot to mention, there's one other thing too. The, the, there's also two other unique locations that you can actually purchase that do not provide units. One of them will give you victory, well not victory points, will give you a currency, silver, for each space that you control that has an animal. So if you have six spaces that give you an animal, that's six extra silver, just for having this as a passive throughout every round. And the other one is like, I guess like a fishery. And the way it works is that at the end, when you're collecting silver at the end of every round, you can choose one space of water that one of your areas is adjacent to, and you'll gain the silver value of that. So if I'm on this space here, and the water space adjacent to it has two silver, I say I get an extra two silver. So these are extra ways to gain currency in the game, which is nice, especially if you get them early on. If you're looking for a chuck and dice game that has a really good feel to it, that has some mitigation, but it's also a bit of luck and something that feels where you have all your own unique factions. The artwork is great. I love the different min the, the, like the miniature like etched different characters. It's really cool and you get a whole bunch of them. Then this is definitely a game to check out. This is actually a game that we played it and throughout the entire time, although it is a long game, Everybody enjoyed the game, and this came from a bunch of different players from different backgrounds. Players who, some, in, in typically like to play games that are 30 to 45 minutes, which this one took a little bit longer because there's a lot more stuff going on, but still had a really good time, and the game was very close because there's very few points. So everybody's getting a lot of points and staying neck and neck. And there's also one last little thing. If there's a tie at the end of the game, what happens is, uh, let's say me and you tied, I would actually get to choose one of my areas that has whatever guy is on it that I want, hopefully my best area, and you will as well. And we'll do one final battle with those two areas to see who the final victor is. I mean, also you can just share the victory if you want, but the cool idea of being able to like have my capital go up against yours and see who the final victor is was a cool addition to how a way you can make a tiebreaker work for a game like this. Anyway, if you're interested in checking out the game, then you can check out at the link down below in the description. For me, it's a solid little game, as long as you don't mind it being longer and it'll start being a little bit more challenging. Thank you guys for watching another Unfiltered Gamer board game review for the game Thania Collapsing World. Uh, if you're interested in picking up the game, there will be a link down below in the description. This is a crowdfunded game. Everything that you see here is a prototype, so keep that in mind that things will be upgraded. In fact, I've already showed you the upgraded little tokens here, which are a very nice, refreshing upgrade to them. I just hope they're double-sided because they look so cool. Um, and if you want, there's a live stream we do on Sundays, but not this Sunday. And of course, um, we have a Wednesday whatnot. That's pretty much it though, guys. If you really appreciated watching our video, then you can go ahead and subscribe and hit that subscribe button, the bell notification button as well. Either way, thank you guys so much for watching. And as always, I look forward to controlling Nathania, the collapsing world, next time.